Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. Nobody is printing money as fast as the U.S. and the Japanese, for instance. In China, they still have interest rates, not great interest rates, but they're still proper interest rates, whereas in Japan and America, there are no interest rates anymore, and in some Germany. Uh, so some countries have done a better, less bad job than others. I am looking because I know enough history to know that somebody's going to come out of this in better shape compared to others who are going to come out in worse shape. The key, of course, is to find out, all right, who? And Where should we be moving our money? And I don't have an answer yet. I do know China is doing a less bad job than Japan, for instance, but I own Japanese shares because they're, you know, they're printing money every day and buying ETFs. Jeff, the Bank of Japan has more money than I do. If they're buying ETFs, I'm buying e- Japanese ETFs. Come on. Hello, everybody. From humble and maybe child labor uh, law questionable beginnings as a child peanut salesman to one of the most well-known traders in the world, our guest today, the one and only Jim Rogers, certainly has left his mark on our industry, and he's not done yet. He's written over 10 books, translated into many languages, taken multiple cross-country slash continent trips on both a motorcycle and a custom car to get to know the local markets better and developed his own commodity index. Uh, and now can add guests of the derivatives to his extensive re- resume. So welcome, Jim. Uh, Jeff, I am delighted to be here. I'm uh, my first time on the derivative and with RCM, so I'm very pleased and very honored. I appreciate it. And you're there in Singapore, your new home away from home? I am in Singapore. It's 11.15 in the morning here. So yes, I've lived here for several years and we're quite pleased. I love it. And I got to ask, I saw the, the picture right over your head of a young couple in an airplane. What's going on there? Well, the, the picture that I think you see is my father and mother as a, he was a young lieutenant in the Second World War before he went off to uh, Europe. Uh, and I, is that the one you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, I can't yeah. see the airplane anymore. But before we started, I could see it. Um, well, wow, they, second he, World lieutenant, they were recently married. They had not had me yet, but they were on the way. Young and in love. And then you were you were in Vietnam. I was I sir I was in the United States Army during the uh, Vietnam time, but I was not in Vietnam. Oh, lucky you! That's why you're still here with us. Um, mm-hmm. so you have such an interesting and great background. I'm not sure where to even start, but I guess I'll go with that first job selling peanuts. How do you become a five year old peanut salesman? Well, my actually my first job when I was five was I I would picked up the empty bottles at the baseball games and the lady gave me five cents for every 24 bottles I picked up. Yeah. That's not a typo. It's yeah. first of all, child labor. Second of all, we'd all be in jail now if you could, if you tried to do this again. But there I was five years old and the lady paid me five cents for every 24 bottles. I remember one night I made a dollar and 15 cents and with so much money that I went home and gave half of it to my younger brother. I was <laughs> Please with myself. The next year, I started selling peanuts and cokes myself, and it was my my concession. But I was six when that happened. Yeah, and where was this? This was in a small town called Demopolis, Alabama. It was very small. Was, my phone number was five when I was growing up in Demopolis, and as I say, we'd all be in jail now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> if a six-year-old kid was selling peanuts and cokes at the baseball games, but it happened, and we're and all was still. It, was it some sort of MLB feeder, or what was it just a local league? Oh no, this was a very small. My, Jeff, my phone number was five. <laughs> five. This local, I mean, it was the Rotary Club playing the Kiwanis Club. It was, <laughs> you know, it was stuff like that. The little league guys. It was, it was nothing. <laughs> it was nothing serious. I mean, it, it, nothing. Certainly, no nobody getting paid except me, <laughs> making yeah. a little bit of money. <laughs> I love it. And then somehow you made it from there to uh, college and on to Wall Street. Yes, I went to college. Uh, I, and when I was in university, I thought I would go to law school and business school and medical school. I was a confused kid like many others. I happened to have a summer job on Wall Street and instantly fell in love because here was a place that would pay me to know what was going on in the world. And that's what I loved. I mean, you I didn't know. know anything. I was 21 years old. I didn't know anything about Wall Street. All I knew was it was in New York somewhere. And something bad had happened in 1929. I didn't know there was a difference in stocks and bonds. I said stocks and bonds, it must be the same thing. I learned and loved it. And loved it. And that's where you and met. Didn't I, go uh, to law school business, I did not go to law school, business school, or medical school. Yeah, I was the same confused kid and ended up a philosophy major. So I think you you had the better end of the stick there. Well, um, wait, 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 wait. Uh, I'm in my second university, I my course was philosophy, politics, and economics. I had to take the philosophy. I didn't understand it. I was no good at it. I was terrible. But Jeff, in later years, I said, oh, now I understand. Now I see what those guys were talking about. I came to understand it. And I'm a, gr I, I'm a great, I tell my daughters, I hope you study philosophy someday. Yeah, it, it just taught me to write was the good thing and, and to not take things at face value, question them. Um, and where was that? Was that Oxford? Yes, that was at Oxford. Uh, as I say, I didn't have a clue, uh, but it did teach me to think, although I didn't sink in until later, later years what they were trying to do. Uh, but it was I had a great time at Oxford. Yes. Uh, but the philosophy, Don, the philosophy professors and I didn't quite see eye to eye. I remember when I got, but you have to take exams at the end of your time. And I got my degree and I remember my philosophy for, and I did reasonably, whether you can either get a first or a second or a third or a fourth. Well, I got a second, much yeah. to my astonishment, but more That's to the philosophy professor's astonishment. He said, how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> He knew I didn't know anything. I did too, but it worked. You got that silver medal. Um, and then somewhere in there, you met Mr. Soros and the rest is history. How did that go down? Well, I was looking for a job at one point on Wall Street and he needed a, a young man. And we met and we hit it off. And well, and we, 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 I went to work there and we started, we had to go and start the company and we did and, and had some reasonable success. So that the understatement of the century. Um, and I'm sure you've talked about it before, but I've never heard you actually talk about it directly. But can you tell us about the famous trade that broke the Bank of England? Did those? I was not there then. I was long, long, long gone. Jeff, I left in 19. Okay. So you were in and out quickly. Well, not quickly, not 10 quickly. years. Uh, 10 years. I was 37 when I retired. I'd wanted, started to retire when I was 36, but waited another year because we're having so much fun. But I had always wanted to have more than one life. I didn't want to wake up at age 90 sitting in front of a keyboard on Wall Street. Yeah. Uh, so my plan had always been to, to have adventure and other lives. So Jeff, let's if you grow up in a town where your phone number is five, five. <laughs> you either never leave or you, or you want to get out and see the world. Well, I wanted to see the world. How many, uh, what was the total number? Was, did it go up to 10? How many did it go up to? No, 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 no. There were, there were, there were some people even had a party line. I don't know if you remember what a party line was, yep. but a party line was with more than one house, one home, had the same number, and it was differentiated by the number of rings. If it rang once, it was for you. If it rang twice, it was for the Jones. If it rang three times, it was for the Browns. Uh, some people even had party lines. That was the original social media. You could pick up and listen in, right? See you what was going on. And people did. People <laughs> yeah. certainly did. My mother tells that story. You couldn't do much in a small town without everybody knowing it. 
<laughs> so that first retirement was when you started to, uh, was that your first motorcycle trip? Well, my hope, my plan was to go around the world on a motorcycle. But yeah, those were the days of Soviet Union, Red China, communism, you know, all of that. So it was almost impossible. It was ludicrous for anybody to think they could motorcycle across China or across the Soviet Union. It took me several years to get permission. I eventually, I, I rode around Central Europe. I did various and sundry adventures. Eventually the Chinese said, okay. They made a move, the PBS made a documentary of it in fact, uh, and I showed it to the Russians. And so the Russians said, well, okay, you may be crazy, but we know you're not a spy, so you yeah. can do it. Knock so, so what did that look like? Where did you, what was that original trip? You started in Europe and ended where? Uh, that first uh, around the world trip, it, it started in, on the uh, west coast of Ireland, on the Atlantic, because I wanted to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific, to Japan. And I turned around and went back through Siberia to the west coast of Ireland again to be the first person to drive from the Atlantic to the Pacific twice. And then Africa, you know, Middle East, Central uh, Australia, uh, down to the bottom of South America and up to Alaska and then back to New York. And I'm still alive. And you your back hurt? I can't imagine being on a motorcycle that long. Well, no, I love motorcycles. Uh, I did never had any of those kind of problems and I, I'm still alive. I still have my arms and legs. Uh, many people get killed in cars and bikes, but some reason I'm still alive and still quite happy. And now I got to ask, cause I had got a little motorcycle uh, background, but what type of bike was it? There's only one well, right answer. I don't know what your right answer is, but yeah, I'm a hopeless mechanic. And so I always rode BMWs, which at the time were the best engineered and the best made and yeah. the most reliable motorcycles of all. So I rode BMWs and they're very smooth, very quiet. So my great, great grandfather was Walter S. Davidson, who was the founder of Harley Davidson. Um, so well, that we... Unfortunately, my grand my grandmother sold out for like five hundred dollars to AMF in nineteen seventy something or fifty something. So we don't have the uh, private island to show for it, but uh, it's a proud heritage. We're proud of it. Well, you should be, hey, Jeff. Listen, if you want to pick up girls or pick up boys, whatever you want to pick up, yeah, nothing like a Harley Davidson. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sure you come riding up to the to the to the tavern on a BMW. They all gonna be looking at your Harley Davidson. They can all be looking at me. So it's yeah, probably yeah, tough to right find right. A, a a part in uh, China for a Harley Davidson. Well, not then. You probably could now, but no, yeah, no. Yeah. If you want to go around the world, at least for me, BMW is right. But if you want many other things in life, nothing like a Harley Davidson. Um, and then you did this all again in a car later on in the Mercedes. Yes, it was a special Mercedes. I'd done it on a motorcycle, so I wanted to do it. And, and I, wanted, I didn't, the first trip was not enough. It was two years, but it wasn't enough because there were things I hadn't seen. So I wanted to go again, but I'd done it on a bike. So I said, all right, I'll go in a, in a sports car. But I had to, we had to make a special sports car because you cannot go around the world without clearance. I assure you, you can't make it without clearance off the ground. Yeah. And you need a diesel engine. You need four wheel drive. So we had to make our own, my own special Mercedes sports car. Nice. And you're doing the full thing, like carrying the gas cans and the whole, whole nine yards. Well, yeah, we had a, we had to make a special trailer because a sports car doesn't have much room for luggage and you know, other <laughs> first aid and things like that. So we made a special matching trailer, which had gasoline, everything, sleeping bags, sleep, tents, first aid, everything. Were you ever uh, tempted to even had an extra bottle of vodka because the doctor said, well, if you get hurt, you're going to need something and you probably won't be able to get any medication. So take this bottle of vodka just in case. Just in case. Uh, were you ever tempted to do sail around the world? No, uh, I have been sailing and I have friends who adore it. But, you know, for me, the main joy of, of the other than the bike, is 
every five minutes there's something new and something different. Now, my sailor friends say, well, that's true with sailing too, but it's not the, quite the same thing. I mean, you don't see different people, different sites, different whatever, uh, which you do when you drive around the world close to the ground. Yeah, he's sailing around the world. You might not see anything for weeks. I know, and that was, but that's why it never really interested me. Let's talk commodities. You know those a little bit, right? Well, I know a bit, yes. I, I've been investing in, in many things for many decades now. So this is, this is not my first rodeo, Jeff. I, I, I know it. Um, so you kind of coined this term back in, well, you tell me when, but commodity super cycle, that was the name of one of your books, right? Well, the name well, of my the book, tagline of the book. Commodities, uh, you know, get them while they're hot. Uh, was, was, nobody cared about commodities in those days. Uh, you may remember, uh, you, well, you're probably not old enough, but in 1998, in fact, Merrill Lynch closed their commodity department because commodities were so hopeless and useless. And that was the exact moment when I started my commodities index and commodities fund uh, because what, what, you know, they don't often ring a bell, Jeff. Right. They rang a bell. Merrill Lynch rang a bell for me anyway in 1998 because I thought I could see that things were about to change and be much better. And so tell us the, the, uh, what was the seed of that thought of like, I'm going all in on commodities. This is a really big thing that's happening. Like, how did that all come about? What was your thought process on that? Well, Jeff, first, you know, I make many mistakes, uh, but that's one I happen to get right. No, I had been around the world. I've been investing in all sorts of things for decades. And I could see that people were not investing in productive capacity. For instance, nobody built offshore drilling rigs anymore to drill for oil. All of these things, Merrill Lynch was closing down. You know, there was no, absolutely no interest in any kind of commodity. Gold had collapsed in 1980 and had been, nothing had happened. Silver had collapsed in 1980. All of these things were sitting there empty, untouched, with no interest, and I could see no productive capacity. Nobody was building mines. Nobody was looking for gold. All, all of these signs that were just simple economic, looking back at it now, but this is what I thought I saw at the moment, at the time. And I said to myself, I've got to invest in commodities because this has got to be a great opportunity. Now, at the time, since I was about to go around the world, there was... I wanted to invest in an index because I couldn't sit and trade commodities going around the world. I looked at all the commodity indices. They were all hopeless. You couldn't believe how I wouldn't put my money into them. But again, that was a reflection of the fact that nobody cared about commodities. Yeah. The commodity index has been set up in the 30s or decades before. So I had to come up with my own commodity index where I could put my money and off I went. And I got it right. Sometimes I get it right. Uh, and that, and how did that look? Were you actually saying, I got a plan, I'm going to go out and research all these mines and stuff, or this is just anecdotal, you're seeing things as you're investing in other things? Which came first? Well, going around the world, I could see that countries, China, for instance, everything was changing in the world. Berlin Wall fell in 1989, and it was very clear that nobody wanted to be a a communist anymore. Nobody wanted to be a socialist. If they did want to be a socialist, they wanted to be rich. So I could see what I had from my travels, I could see what was happening in the world. On the demand side, I could see what was happening in China and the Soviet Union, Africa. You know, at one time, everybody in Africa was a socialist or a communist. Well, all that ended. Nobody wanted to do any of that anymore. So I could see that the demand was changing dramatically. But I could also see that the supply, nothing was happening. As I said, nobody built an offshore drilling rig for a long time. In the 70s, they did. But this was all had ended. So supply and demand, Jeff, supply and demand. Nobody can repeal the laws of supply and demand. I mean, a lot of politicians try, but you cannot do it. So I thought I could see a boom or at least a bull market was coming. And it did. It did. And then it lasted through uh, like 07. And then the wheels kind of came off the whole 
the whole concept or how do you remember that? Well, it depends on what you're looking at. I mean, gold peaked in 2011, oil went up until 2013, 14, whatever. Uh, various and sundry things, you know, it's like any market. People talk about the stock market. Well, there are many different stocks. So yeah. I, I and others say, no, no, it's a market of stocks. And likewise with commodities. Some commodities did extremely well for several, several more years. Some stopped sooner. But the whole concept of like China and the super cycle kind of ran its course through like 08 and the recession, right? It kind of slowed everything down. Well, again, you, you say those dates. Uh, I mean, gold, gold peaked in 2011, uh, uh, for instance, just to use a bad example. But, well, okay, well, it didn't last forever. Nothing lasts yeah. forever. I wrote a book about it and explained, no, these things don't go on forever. They last for X number of years. Then they go down for X number of years. Then it all starts over again. There have been various commodity bull markets in history and various commodity bear markets in history. So this is nothing unusual. And what what do you think? I'm always telling people like the seems to me technology is deflationary, right? So we're creating all this new technology. We can drill down 3000 feet in the Gulf of Mexico, then go over a thousand feet and get at this oil we could never get to before. So is that innovation like outpacing the demand growth? Do you think that's part of what's kept for the last I mean, the last quarter, we've started to see the rise in commodities again. But for five years before that, grain prices, oil prices have all been rather capped. Well, there's a saying in the commodity business, and it should be in all businesses, that the cure for high prices is high prices. prices. Because <laughs> high prices cut demand and, and bring in supply. And that's what happened. Uh, the other part of the saying is the cure for low prices is low prices. If prices are low a long time, people buy more and stop producing. So, I mean, these cycles have been going on for thousands, hundreds of years, certainly, and probably thousands, and that's going to continue. Right. Prices have been going up. We had a high price of oil, made people and the declining reserves of oil, reserves of oil, known reserves were declining everywhere, still are. And then long, so that begat Fracking, new technology came along, and Jeff, for a while there, if you could spell fracking, people would <laughs> give you money, you know, and a bubble developed. Then, of course, we all realized, oh wait, we got to make money. These guys got to pay their debts. Right. So the fracking bubble popped and burst, as all bubbles do. Now, you, fracking's still there, but you got to make money at it now. So, known reserves of oil still continue to decline except for fracking and fracking's not a bubble anymore is fracking f-r-a-k-i-n apostrophe fracking <laughs> well you're in chicago you know how to spell all the commodities better than anybody you should anyway that's true um and what about um so t tell me a little about about the index how it's different than some of the others but it and it still does then i want to come back to it's still got a pretty healthy energy component but just Generally speaking, how does it differ from the others? Well, uh, it certainly outperformed the others, so it uh, pre presumably is better constructed. Uh, most of the other, in, I mean, the other indexes didn't have rice, for instance, although, you know, most of the people in the world eat rice every day. I could go on and on. You know, they, they didn't have many things. Uh, so I wanted to have an index which was reflective of the cost of doing business around the world and the cost of being alive around the world. So I sat down with my commodity research uh, bureau yearbook and other sources yeah. and figured out it's who the RB used, index. That was one of the originals. Yeah, I wanted to see who who uses what and why and how. And by the way, the CRB index, which was one of the originals had orange juice and oil with the same weighting. I said, <laughs> Whoops. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that, can't, that cannot be, that's not a reflection of being alive. It must so, have been a Floridian who came up all with them. As I said, they didn't have rice, the, the CRB had oil and commodity and orange juice, et cetera, et cetera. So I came up with what I hoped and thought might be a reflection. And first of all, I had many, many more. It has over 35 commodities. The others have many fewer. Uh, 
I wanted to have a reflection of what I thought it caused to do business around the world. <laughs> I knew a lot of people ate rice every day, uh, even though the U.S. indices didn't have rice. I mean, I had experienced some of these things. I knew that oil was more important than orange juice, etc. So I tried to come up with weightings that were somewhat reflective. And energy, as you know, Jeff, is at least to me the most important commodity, everything, I mean, whether it's electricity, to, which we all need to make things, or oil to move them, or oil to make the anything, the machines move. Oil is the most important, co- energy is the most important commodity. So that's why it's got a bigger weighting. Right. See uh, Texas two weeks ago, as an example, <laughs> right? With the freeze out and everything locked down. But so let's talk about that for a second. In the new world, right, energy is becoming less and, well, I'll rephrase that. Oil, you know, fossil fuels becoming less and less important. We're getting all the renewables online. Does that eventually need to be reweighted at some point? Well, obviously, if the world changes, you have to, re- you have to change with the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, but if, if orange juice causes cancer, we're going to get orange juice out of the indices. People aren't going to trade orange juice anymore. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, energy is still the most important commodity, uh, at least if you ask me. Uh, as I go, I live in Singapore, and everybody here is still driving and taking the bus to work, et cetera, still has electricity. And nearly all energy comes from oil and natural gas. Yeah. But that may be changing. It seems to be changing. But, you know, Jeff, even if you look at things like electric cars, which seem to be coming, uh, first of all, you got to produce the electricity, which got to be made from something. Maybe it's sun power, maybe it's solar power or wind power. But electric cars, for instance, use five times as much copper as, no, as regular cars. So, yeah, the demand for oil may go down, but the demand for copper is going to go up and lead and lithium and other things. That was going to be my next question of some of these uh, rare earth metals that are used in all the batteries we use these days, like, but they're not necessarily exchange traded. Like, how do you square that of things that aren't exchange traded, but that are a part of cost of, of living? Well, you've got to have, if you're going to have a, a traded index, you've got to have things that are traded. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you can have one, I guess, with non-traded uh, it, entities but not me I, that's hard to track it's hard you, you, you somebody has to make up the prices every no 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 I, you need something visible at least I need something visible to have a proper index and but do you look personally to invest in some of those things like lithium and some of those battery components well, at various times in my life I actually owned a, a company a share that had there was a had lithium mines. Uh, yes, I have invested in some of these things, but through companies, not through the the private the private markets. I mean, you yeah. could invest in Chrome or various and other things uh, privately if you want, or even the companies which mine it. But not as far as an index is concerned, a publicly traded index. And what are your thoughts on commodities versus commodity companies? Right? There's often people say, "Cool, I love gold. I'm going to invest in this gold miner." And then it takes on a lot of debt or goes bankrupt or something and they're left holding the bag. They didn't get the, the commodity performance they were looking for. Well, Mark Twain once said that the definition of a gold mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing. Because <laughs> <laughs> he lost a lot of money in a gold mine. Jeff, if you can find the right gold mine, if you can find a goal, a company which is going to discover gold in Berlin, I urge you to buy every share you can and then send me an email. I want to buy it too. Yeah. But as Mark Twain discovered and many other hundreds of gold mines and silver mines, but let's use gold, are hundreds of these things. And you've got to get the right one. If you can get the right one, you're going to make a staggering amount of money. But otherwise, you're going to lose a lot of money. So it depends on who you are, what you know. Uh, the way you in, invest in it. I mean, if you're good at futures and timing, uh, futures are fantastic. You get great leverage. If you get the timing right, you'll probably make staggering amounts of money in gold futures. 
either long or short. But again, you have to know what you're doing. Preaching to the choir. Um, and you mentioned long, short. So that, why have you always been just pure kind of buy and hold? I want to be long commodities instead of I want to trend follow commodities or something of that nature of going long and short. Well, no, there's nothing wrong with that. That by all stretch, if, if you're a good trader and you know what you're doing, you can make a huge amount of money trading anything, stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, whatever it is. Uh, but f for me on that particular moment, when I was heading off around the world, I knew I was going to be gone for, I hoped I was going to be gone for three years. And I wanted to be long because I thought there was the beginning of a bull market. And many studies have shown that if you invest in an index, you're going to outperform most active managers. Yeah. It's a sad comment on, on all of us in our industry, but it happens to be correct and accurate. So for me, a commodity index and a commodity index fund was what I needed at the time. And still, I mean, you know, you, if you want to invest in stocks, most people are better off buying stock index fund than trying to pick stocks. That's the studies show that's true of all investments. And I think the best thing you had in that whole thing was buying it and then not looking at it for three years going away. Right. Like that's the ultimate weapon. I have learned Jeff over the years that, that I'm not a very good tra I'm the worst trader in the world, worst market time in the world. So for me, especially if a bull market, if I find something cheap, that I think is going to go up for a long time. I don't want to know the price. I used to open accounts in countries and the broker would say, well, shall I call you every day or every month? I said, no, 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 I don't want to know. I don't want to know the prices because if I know the prices, if it goes up a lot, I might sell it. If it goes down a lot, I might sell it. Don't, I don't want to know the prices. But when I think a few years from now that the country's changing or the market's changing, I'll call you back and we'll sell. So I'm, I'm not very, I'm horrible at market time. And I'm still amazed by this ability that you have of like, when I think the country's changing, like that just pops into your head or do you have a process and a structure for how to look at that? Jeff, what's wrong with you? I call RCM. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you call me at RCM, right? Yeah, you call RCM with you. To I find say, out. hey, Vietnam's changing, get out. Yes. No, I mean, I, I'm interested in the world. As I said, beginning of this program, I'm, I'm very interested in what's happening in the world. I try to pay attention. And when I think I see something's happening, uh, like China, I mean, I could see the gigantic changes in China when I went there in the 80s. And so I wanted to invest and I still own Chinese shares. I mean, China has been the most successful country in the world for the past 40 years or so. Uh, I don't see any reason to sell China, not yet anyway. It may yeah. come a time when my daughters or my granddaughters may sell China someday. But I mean, if you'd sold America a uh, hundred years ago, you would have looked great for a while. But you would look pretty foolish over the next 80 years. Yeah. And that's, I hope my girls wake up one day and say, look at all these Chinese shares. He must have been smart. We're rich. <laughs> You know, and you moved there so your daughters could learn Mandarin, right? Well, we Art. wanted to, we thought we'd move to China, but China was too polluted. Uh, I don't speak uh, Chinese, so Singapore was fabulous. They speak English and they speak Chinese here. So we moved to, and Singapore has been another great, great, great success story over the past 40 or 50 years. Astonishing. Uh, so it's been a very good move because my children do speak perfect Mandarin now. I, my plan was, to, I hoped to prepare them for the 21st century by knowing Asia and by speaking Mandarin. So far, um, that, that's work. That's work. But they're still teenagers. And do you keep a, a pulse on those Chinese futures markets, like with the rebar and all those different? They've got some unique commodities over there. Yeah, but, but it's impossible unless you're somebody special, it's impossible to, for foreigners to invest in those markets. So yeah, I'm aware of them. That is something you can call RCM for. We're, we're making progress on that front. Um, and you they said just, the operative words, making progress. Yeah, well, yeah. okay. <laughs> those markets have been there for 30 years. People have been making progress for 30 years. It's like the 
the currency. They've been opening the currency since 2005 and making progress. <laughs> when you get them open, you let me know. Okay. Yeah. Well, they're doing a billion contracts now a year on those on their four exchanges. So it's it's coming. Um, no. Uh, Jeff, I'm well aware of it, you know, in Dalian, they trade more com- than soybeans than they do in Chicago, and Chicago invented soybeans. Yeah. So, no, no, I know what's going on, but it, so what? They won't, I'm a foreigner. Yeah. Doesn't do me any good. Now, if you're, you know, a big commodity company, if you're Cargill or something, I'm sure you can trade in, in China. I'm not Cargill. Well, you could be, not yet. No, no, um, no, no. I'm not even RCM. <laughs> And what do you, um, do you, do you look at any of those like Chinese hedge fund managers or some of their onshore um, asset management firms? Well, I've, I've met some of them. Yeah, of course I, I, I yeah, but I don't, I don't talk to them. I don't talk to anybody. I, I, <laughs> I have learned in my style that if I listen to other people, I loosely use money, lose money. It confuses me. I don't know what's going on. So I, I don't really sit around talking to anybody about investing. Got it. You're, you're reading your own tea leaves, right? Um, so far, I assure you, Jeff, if you give me a hot tip, I'm sure I, and I acted on it, I'm sure I would lose money. Not because of you, just yeah. it always happens to me. And what do you think about the Chinese in terms of their like reporting on their numbers and their agriculture, right? It seems like they can toy with the U.S. commodity prices whenever they want by saying we're all, our demand is up, our demand's down, we're going to buy this much, we're not going to buy this much. Jeff, you believe governments? No, I don't believe them. I'm saying what, how does... I'm sitting here saying what? This guy invests in, <laughs> is an investor and he believes governments? I don't believe any government. I know they all lie, including the U.S. government. What are you talking about? Of course, I don't believe the Chinese. I don't believe the Germans. I mean, even the Germans have been caught lying, uh, governments. So no, I'll rephrase it. I'll rephrase the question. Learned, you better do your own work or you're going to go broke. I'll rephrase the question. Why do U.S. traders believe and react to the Chinese numbers anymore? I guess that's the better question. Well, the main reason is because they know other people do. Yeah. I mean, if we all wake up and there's a storm, we're going to react um, and whether we should or we shouldn't. And of course, the, the U.S. traders know that all the other traders, whether they're Japanese or German or American, are going to react to the numbers. And so they do, too. That's part of the markets. But that's back to the short term. I don't even pay attention. That's why I don't want to know. I don't want to know the short term fluctuations. Yeah. And so what what's your view on uh, China overall? Is this super cycle coming back? Have they built all they can build? build? What's the demand side, like the big picture demand side look like for you out of China? Well, I haven't been to China in a year because I haven't been anywhere for a year. If I could go, I can't get there. There's no planes. Uh, But when I'm on the Internet, I see that China, that things are bustling, that people are in the shops, the streets, at the the bars, the discos, you know, things are happening. Uh, I can see that much anyway. They seem to have done a less bad job than most countries. So yes, the Chinese economy, and they say the Chinese economy is recovering. What evidence I have seen indicates that that's accurate. So is it going to be enough to offset uh, other countries that have problems? Perhaps, but uh, all countries will be recovering and reviving because there's been so much money spent. And back to, you know, commodities are supply and demand, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, you can have a great, you can have demand go down and have a huge bull market if the supply go. Look at lead. You remember lead? You know, at one point in America, we outlawed lead in gasoline and in paint. Mm-hmm. And you would think, oh, my God, that's the end of the lead market. No yeah. more pe- no more gasoline, no more paint. Lead boomed. Because there was no supply. There was no demand collapsed, price boom because there was no supply. So you got to remember it's supply and demand for everything. I, that would be an interesting thing to poll a bunch of millennials and say, do you know what unleaded means? <laughs> they probably just think that's what they call gasoline, right? Like, no, it used to have lead and they took the lead out. It's unleaded. When I was a kid, that was leaded and unleaded. Well, first, when I was a kid, it was only leaded. And then they came up with unleaded. Yeah. 
what's your thoughts on the money printing? Good, bad, indifferent? Well, throughout history, uh, if you print a lot of money, it has ultimately led to a debasement of your currency. Um, what for me seems to be obvious reasons, and that's what's happened. And when currencies go down, something has to go up against it. And usually real assets go up against the currencies. And so uh, I would suspect that we're going to have the price of real goods going higher. We always have anyway. But again, you have to consider the supply and demand aspects of it as well. But if you have a lot of money printing, the value of the money is going to go down and the value of something is going to go up against it, whether it's sugar or, you know, who knows what, lead, something. Gold, Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin has been a fabulous investment for many people. Uh, not for me. I have never bought nor sold any cryptocurrency. But, Jeff, I would also point out to you, I'm sure you know that hundreds of cryptocurrencies have disappeared and gone to zero. We don't hear about those anymore. We hear about the, everybody knows about Bitcoin, including me, yeah. but I have never bought or sold it. Um, part of the reason I, I have never is because I know that in history, if people, governments don't like to lose the monopoly and they don't like to lose control. And if cryptocurrencies become competitive as currency, most governments, if not all governments, are going to outlaw them. Now, the crypto guys say, well, we're they smarter that's than the, the government. That's the point of it, right? Of yeah. Of course, the crypto guys are smarter than the government. The government's got the guns and the tanks. And if, if most people, if they say it's a crime, I anyway am not going to use it. Um, this has happened throughout history. Every, all money is going to be on the computer. I mean, the China, if you go to China, you can't take a taxi with money. You yeah. can't buy an ice cream with money. You, it's all on, your phone. on the phone or you can't do anything. Uh, they're ahead of us. And, but we and everybody else is working on computer money, electronic money, crypto money, call it what you will. But it's going to be government money. I mean, I don't like that, but I know what's happening. Governments love it. Right. And I've, I've heard you say on another podcast of, right, as soon as they label it treason and the punishable by death, there's, there's not going to be a lot of demand. Well, that's what happened in the 1930s. People could use anything they wanted for money. And then the Bank of England said, uh, starting next week, it's an act of treason. If you use anything for money except our money, well, most people immediately, you know, treason means they execute you, Jeff. Yeah. Most people stop using seashells and sugar cubes and their own money. They, as late they, as 1930, they were using seashells and sugar cubes? Well, I don't know what if they were using, but you could use any <laughs> if you wanted. You could write a contract in seashells. Yeah, yeah. And there were places in Africa still that used seashells in those days. But no, you, nobody used anything except government money after that. And how, how do you view that everyone's trying to play the same game, though, right? So if... U.S. is trying to devalue to get out from their debt load. Japan's been trying it for 20 years already. Europe's trying it. So if we're all trying it, it's not like one's going to fail and the rest are going to survive. It seems like, well, I'll just try it and we stay at the same level. Well, uh, when you say the same level, the same level of currency values? No, like the same relative value. Like no one, no one country will blow up because we're all trying it at the same time, right? If one country just tried it and failed at it, they might blow up and cause a big problem. And the dollar would hugely appreciate. But it seems well, like if we're all doing it. it it's going to preclude one from blowing up versus the others. Well, you are, that's insightful that everybody is doing the same thing now. Everybody is printing money as fast as they can. But there are, it, it, not everybody, I should retract that. So nobody is printing money as fast as the U.S. and the Japanese, for instance. In China, they still have interest rates, not great interest rates, but they're still proper interest rates. Whereas in Japan and America, there are no interest rates anymore. And in some Germany, uh, so some countries have done a better, less bad job than others. I am looking because I know enough history to know that somebody's going to come out of this in better shape compared to others 
who are going to come out in worse shape. The key, of course, is to find out, all right, who? And Where should we be moving our money? And I don't have an answer yet. I do know China is doing a less bad job than Japan, for instance. But I own Japanese shares because they're, you know, they're printing money every day and buying ETFs. Jeff, the Bank of Japan has more money than I do. If they're buying ETFs, I'm buying Japanese ETFs. Come on. You think so, we'll see that in the U.S. of uh, U.S. purchase of actual stocks and securities? I mean, yeah. they already did it in the bond ETFs, right? <laughs> yeah, no, the, the U.S. government has made it legal for the central bank, the Federal Reserve, to buy other assets. And when things get really bad, they're going to do everything they can to save themselves. They don't care about you or your kids or my kids. They care about the next election. And the way they do that is if they have to, is they flood the money, they're all going to buy IBM or Ford or whatever they're going to buy. Yeah, and I've, I've heard you is talk. Is it good? No. Is it good? No, no, it's not good. But the, who cares what I say? <laughs> and I've heard you talk about the Switz. Frank is back now by Google. Right? Like, I will tell you, when I was a kid, there was nothing sounder in the world than the Swiss franc. It was sounder than gold, even in those days. You got um, some gold right there. I love it. Well, I got gold. I got silver. Don't you? I mean, you never know when you might need a little gold or a little silver. Not, uh, not here in this desk, but I'm. I like it. Well, I got it in my pocket too. You want me to look in my pocket? See, yeah. a little silver in my pocket, just in case. Uh, the Swiss franc, the Swiss National Bank, for whatever reason, has started expanding its holdings. They own all the fat hot stocks. I presume they probably own Alibaba and Tencent as well and Samsung and the rest of them. Um, you know, the Swiss National Bank now is a, owns a lot of shares. And someday, and they don't talk about it a lot, and the more you question them, the less they talk about it. I've noticed they really have stopped talking about it recently. Uh, the Swiss franc is no longer backed by integrity. It's now backed by Google. <laughs> <laughs> when the world finds, I mean, nothing, I'm not saying Google doesn't have integrity. I'm just saying that, you know, the value of Amazon compared to the value of Swiss integrity and the Swiss mindset is somewhat different. Although if you, most of the world today might say, I'd rather have shares in Google than gold, right? I'd rather have it be Google back than gold back. Well, the Swiss National Bank has said that. Yeah. <laughs> They have a lot more Google than they have gold now. Right. And it's got a lot more upside potentially. Um, so wanted to ask you just, you're known for these rather huge proclamations, right? Of like, we're going to see the biggest bear market since the thirties. Commodities are going to be on the super cycle. Like, is that come to you naturally? Is that a blessing or a curse? Do you get like put in those mindsets and you, you can't see anything else? Or is that just, when, Are you talking up your book? Yeah. You say that's a, uh, whatever grandiose say, whatever. But I mean, to me, it's just a simple fact. I look around the world. I know that in 2008, we had a horrible problem in the world because of too much debt. Yeah. Well, I mean, I read the same newspapers you do. I know that since 2008, debt all over the world has skyrocketed. So I say to myself, well, the next time we have a problem, it's got to be the worst in my lifetime because the debt is so, so much worse than 2008. To me, that's just a simple statement. Yeah. Simple observation like, you know, we're going to have bad blizzards every few years. Yeah, well, You have bad blizzards. If I tell you we're going to have horrible blizzards every few years, is that a grandiose statement? Look at what happened in Texas. You know, it happens. And when I say the next bear market is going to be the worst in my lifetime, I know what happened in 2008. I know what's happened since. How can it not be? To me, that's just a simple observation. Um, so a blessing, right? It's good. You like it? I don't know if it's a blessing or not. Then I got to do something about it. <laughs> and Well, to me, it's a blessing. I do. I do. A lot of the other people in the financial industry, right? They don't want to put themselves out there like that, or they'll hedge their language or like, well, it could be this or that, or in this range. And they're very careful about their persona. So I think for you, right? Like you've got some FU money and you're just like, Hey, this is what I think I'm putting it out there. If you don't like it, you know, talk to the next guy. 
Well, yes, absolutely. But it's not that. I just observe the world and I say, say what I observe. It's yeah. a simple. Well, simple. I think other people would be even afraid to say what they observe because people are, might say, hey, you're wrong. Yeah. Ah, well, yeah, well, I don't have a job. So, you know, I don't. You're not going to get worry. fired. Yeah. At least I don't have to worry. At the moment, I don't have to worry about uh, having a job. So, I don't mind saying what's on my mind, what I observe. You know, you know, Jeff, even now China has debt. In 2008, China had a lot of money saved for a rainy day. It started raining. They started spending the money and helped save the world. Now, even China has, there are going to be bankruptcies in China. It's going to shock, it's going to shock me. And I just told you it's coming. It's already <laughs> happening. It's already happening. So the next bear market is going to be a nightmare. Now, here, is that some kind of huge observation or is that just simple looking out the window? To me, it's looking out the window, a simple statement. Well, out your window is China. So you got it. It's a little easier. <laughs> well, a lot of things out my window. India's over there. There's Australia. I mean, a variety <laughs> of things out my window. Uh, and I thought you were going to say China was going to be that uh, that cleanest, dirtiest shirt that uh, came out of the wash as the new reserve currency. Well, I don't know. That's a that's a difficult statement, given that the Chinese currency is still a blocked currency. You, you can't have a an international currency or medium of reserve uh, reserve yeah. currency if it's blocked. So saying that in 2021 is a little crazy. They have been opening up since 2005, but I mean, I'd do it today if I was, but yeah, they don't listen to me. They don't listen to anybody. They're going to do it their way. And yeah, yeah I'd open the currency plan. after me. They're doing it more and more and more every year. But so saying that Bryn Nenby is going to, it, it is the only currency I see now which can conceivably compete with the U.S. dollar down the road, but down the road a lot can happen. And what whatever happened with all this talk of they own all our treasuries and they can just stop buying treasuries and the U.S. is in big trouble? Um, it seems we hear less and less of that big fear mongering these days. Jeff, if anybody stops buying our treasuries, yeah. <laughs> including ourselves, right? Including ourselves, including the social security system. Yeah. I mean, the United States is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. doesn't matter who stops buying our treasuries. We've got a problem. We have a problem even if people continue to buy our treasuries. I mean, Jeff, it's, not, it's a good time to be old. Yeah. Because the old yeah. people are getting the benefits of all of them. It's not a good time to be young. I got two teenage children. Oh. The problems they're going to inherit, it's not a good time to be young. It's a good time to be old. All right. Well, I'm getting there at an ever-increasing rate. So, um, the oh, better hurry. My best advice to everybody is get old as fast as you can. Get old as fast as you can. Although I don't like the part where your kids grow up, seem to grow up super fast. <clears throat> well, I don't either. I tell my kids every day, stop growing up, stop growing up. Well, the teenagers, they don't listen to me. Never, no teenagers have ever listened to me, especially these. Uh, and where are they going to go to school in Asia or in the U.S.? To college. Well, I mean, who knows? The older one is applying to universities now. She's very, very keen to go to university in the U.S. Uh, she says that we have deprived her of her American childhood because we brought her to Asia to teach her about Asia and Mandarin. Uh, so she insists on going to school in the U.S. So, yes, she's hoping and planning to go to school university in the United States, which is fine with me. No, it's great. Everybody yeah. should see as much of the world as they can. Hey, we got good schools over here. Although everyone's saying now if the, the applications are like double because you had every, all the ones from last year with COVID got delayed. So now there's twice as many people coming into this one year. No, I know that. And that's a huge uh, disadvantage for her and for everybody, of course. Yeah. And, and this year, many universities said you don't have to take the ACT or the SAT. So that meant even more people applied. I said, ah, I wouldn't be any good on those tests. So I'll, I'll why not? Why not apply? Um, I had one more thought on the all the debt that we have across all these governments. Why don't they all just get together and say, we're going to have a global reset. Let's wipe all this out. Start over. Hooray. What, what's going to happen? Yeah. Who's going to, what's going to happen to all the endowments? 
What's going to happen to the Social Security fund? Who's going to pay you your Social Security? What about the insurance companies? They're all going to have no assets, no reserves. When you when you get a heart attack, who's going to pay for your your hospital? Yeah, that's one. That's a great plan. But there's another side too. You wipe out all the assets. Yeah. That means all the people with assets are suddenly not going to have any assets. What but do you do about them? If they all are owning their own debt, right? In theory, they could wipe out all that debt. And then just still pay out the assets to the actual end, end users. Wait a minute. If Princeton University has its, all its assets wiped out, how are they going to continue to No, no, no I'm, saying that, I'm saying if the Fed owns treasuries, if the central bank owns treasuries, in theory, they can say, I don't need to get paid on those, right? But they could still pay Princeton. They can still pay whatever. Oh, you mean we're just going to wipe out the debt that the government owns? Yeah, but like across all the governments, say, hey, all this cross-governmental debt, psh, let's wipe it, keep all the private sector assets in place. So I don't the know. Insurance I'm, companies I'm are still, the insurance companies are still going to have their assets so they can pay if you have a car accident. Yeah. It's only the government that's going to wipe out. Yeah, this is, this is my pet theory. Well, I mean, hooray. <laughs> and, and, and no, there's now there's a, whenever there's a problem, people look for a, a theory. Uh, Mr. Marx had a great theory and a lot of people tried it for a long time. Uh, nobody wants to be a Marxist anymore, but it was wonderful theory. Now there's one called MMT, more money today. Everybody loves it. It's a fabulous theory. And we'll probably try something like that. Or maybe your, your approach, we'll probably try something like that. Is that the official uh, acronym, MMT, More Money Today? That's a Jim Rogers special? Well, that's what I call it because that's what it is. That's, in essence, what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, like Marxism was a free lunch for everybody. Well, it didn't work. And MMT, whatever the real name is, More Money Today, basically it's More Money Today. The British are actually practicing it you, uh, in theory. I mean, they're not publicizing, but that's what they're doing. Now, they're, I think somebody in Britain has, has figured it out recently and said, wait, we got to stop this. But that's what they've been doing. It's an easy way. And Jeff, people love easy answers. But I, And I said this on our last pod with uh, Veneer Bansali of, if I ask my nine-year-old daughter, like, hey, if I give this group my money to hold for three years and keep safe and then give it back to me after three years, should they pay me or should I pay them for that service? She'd probably say like, no, you should pay them for that service of keeping that money safe and making sure it gets back to you. So it seems there's somewhat of a perverse, you know, do we have like a, the human right to demand an interest rate on our, on our debt, on our money? Well, Jeff, I mean, history is full of people who want easy answers and want the easy way and don't want to suffer pain. I mean, that's, that's hum, human beings. Yeah. They're nine years old or 69. <laughs> that's, what, that's what people want uh, in life. And often there are more people with votes or guns or whatever it happens to be, and they get their way. Or they try, as I said, lots of people love Mr. Marx and his theories and love trying them. But I also know, I tell you, when I went around the world I, after the Berlin Wall fell, I realized nobody wants to be a, commie, a Marxist anymore. And if they do, they want to be rich. Yeah. There comes a time. But now, of course, this 30 years later, over 30 years later, and a lot of problems building up. So people now need easy answers again. I hear you. When there's not any easy answers. Um, there is an easy answer. There's more money today. Print it, print it, print it, or your solution. Just renounce the debt. Yeah. Um, well, not my solution. I was just play, playing devil's advocate. The, uh, uh, a solution. An easy solution might be to renounce all the debt. So last question for you. The your book, The Hot Commodities, 1998, 30 years later, 33 years later, you see similarities, you see a bunch of differences. Where do you, how do you compare and contrast those two when you look across the spectrum well, today? I, 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 
if we're speaking specifically about commodities, um, we had a big boom. Uh, oil went from nothing to 150 US dollars a barrel. Uh, it's now back to 60 US dollars a barrel or whatever it is. Now we had booms and that's happened with many, many commodities since, since then, you know, many commodities boomed and collapsed. I would suspect from what I can see, those that, that as I look around, Jeff, bonds are in a bubble all over the world, as we've discussed. Property in many places uh, sold. I mean, I can't believe what a bubble there is in property and sold in many other cities around the so world. So, Korea? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, many stocks are beginning to form bubbles. I mean, not all stocks. I mean, there are many stocks that are still not up, but I can see the, the fact that some stock, I mean, 10 cent, Amazon, Samsung, I mean, some of these stocks never go down. Uh, yeah. I've seen bubbles before. I know you have too, or read about them. So I can see, but, but commodities, that's the only asset class I see that's still cheap. Silver's down 45% from its all time high. Sugar's down, I don't know, 70 or 80% from its all time high. Oil's down over 50% from its all time high. So commodity is the only asset class as a class that I see that's still cheap. And I know the fundamentals are changing. You know, more people in America study public relations and study agriculture now. You know, the highest rate of suicide in the UK is in agriculture. Really? I mean, Jeff, agriculture has been a nightmare all over the world. All oh, over yeah. the we, world. we help farmers with their hedging. And for four years, it was brutal. This year, finally, they got a little light at the end of the tunnel. But um, yeah, you well, didn't. I mean, RCM knows this as well as I do, I'm sure. You know, agriculture, the fundamentals of agriculture worldwide have been terrible for a long time. Yeah, too much. But we're, they're not making any more land, and we're sure as heck making more people, right? Except for Japan. Well, I do know that throughout history, we've had big, long cycles with all sectors of the world economy. You read literature, you read history, you know that sometimes the greatest, richest people have been the farmers, whether they had a plantation or whatever, you know, whether, whether they were English or Russian, it didn't matter. They were rich and rich and rich. We've also had times when they were really poor and peasants, you know, so this is not the first time we've had these long cycles and we're probably having them again. I love it. Um, all right. I'm going to ask you a few of your favorites, a little rapid fire, unless you got any other thoughts on the world at large. Be careful because <laughs> I, I'm going to say, I, and I think this is a simple statement. The next bear market, the next economic dislocation will be the worst in my lifetime. And to me, that's a simple because 2008 was a horrible time. And since because of too much debt and since then, the debt everywhere in the world has skyrocketed. And so in your but lifetime, what's not be? I can don't see how it, if there's somebody who thinks that's some kind of crazy statement, please tell me why I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong. Yeah. Tell me, so in your lifetime, what's the biggest drawdown? 2008 S&P, like 56% or so? Oh, no. I mean, there have been, you know, the great bubble in Kuwait in the late 70s. It went to zero. A uh, great Japanese bubble in the late 80s. You know, the stock, the market okay, went from 40,000 to 7,000. The, the Japanese stock market is still down. 35% from its all time high. And that was over 30 years ago. That was some gigantic dislocal, what do you call them? Drawdowns. Drawdowns, still yeah. Um, all right. So I thought you were just talking, I'm US centric here, but you're saying worldwide is going to be the worst we've seen in your lifetime. Well, okay. I, I mean, I've always invested all over the world for many yeah. decades. And I, 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 when I look out the window, I look at the world, I don't see just Missouri. You know, I see, I see other places as well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the debt is every is staggering. Even the Germans have debt now. You got German cities that are in serious trouble. Germany, yeah. for goodness sakes! No, this is happening everywhere. And 
I just got off topic there for saying, but do you think that's a problem that we're so US centric? Like most portfolios are, right, have little to no foreign stock exposure. Um, there's a lot of new programs coming out where they're hedging, right, maybe trend following and equities, but the equities is all S&P. You got any thoughts on that? Of, of you've long well, been diversified I mean, across the world. Yeah, yeah. If, if you can make money, you have your way and you're good at it. Don't listen to me. Do it your way. Yeah. Don't try to copy somebody else. Don't take advice from some guy you see on the TV or the internet. If you're good at trading 18 stocks, wherever they trade those 18 stocks and ignore me. Yeah. I, anyway, have always invested all over the world and in all asset classes, both long and short. That's been my way. But everybody has their own way. I used to work for Roy Newberger. Roy Newberger traded like nobody I've ever seen. I don't know if he knew what IBM did. It didn't matter. <laughs> he could trade IBM like crazy. He was over 100 when he died, still going down there every day. And he was shocking he was so good. You think I could tell Roy Newberger to buy Danish krona? Oh, my God. <laughs> he wouldn't know what Danish krona were, and he wouldn't care. Yeah. And he shouldn't. Um. And so you mentioned you long and short. Do you have any shorts you're looking at? Not at the moment. Well, Besides not bonds. at the moment. I'm looking. I mean, I see what you see. I see bubbles developing, but I'm not shorting. Them. I mean, I, I have <laughs> learned the hard way. Yeah. Bubbles, bubbles go on much higher and do much crazier things than anybody can believe. I'm not, I'm not shorting anything. Wise. Wise well, man. Well, I, I've started shorting junk bonds by buying reverse bond ETFs. But, but even that is so small, it's not worth talking about. We'll move on to the favorites, give you some rapid fire answers. So over your, uh, all your motorcycle and car trip, what was your favorite spot? Might be like picking your favorite daughter, but what was your favorite spot on all those trips? Or I'll take two or three if you can't narrow it down to one. I, I, I will tell you that crossing the Sahara Desert is one of the most extraordinary and exciting and romantic things you will ever do if you survive. If yeah, you survive. I don't know if I'll ever do it, but... It, Sahara so. Desert is the size of the continental United States. It's huge and there are no roads and it's a disaster. But if you do it, and I've done it three times, I will tell you, it is unbelievable how exciting and fabulous if you make it and a lot and, of people and when, and when i picture it it's dead flat is that com completely wrong is it are no, there it's, not, of oh, sand? It's, flat. it's it's hard desert yeah most okay. of them for the most part yeah nothing yeah. there sand sand, sand. But there's not big sun, mountains of sun and sand well no there are dunes there are certainly dunes yeah. in, in any desert but but it's not it's not it's not like the, going through the rockies or something yeah yeah it's, there are dunes, but it's it's big, flat, no water, no anything, no people. What was the least favorite or most difficult? I don't have an answer to that. You know, what comes to mind, I remember being held hostage in the Congo for nine days at one time. But even that was interesting and <laughs> laughable and a great experience. We were held hostage by the police. They wanted money. They would take us to the disco. We would go out to dinner. One of the police chief has had us come to his house at night for dinner. Uh, we all went to the disco together, but we were held hostage. Uh, finally, I convinced them we didn't have any money and they wouldn't just put us on the road because they wanted to get us out of there. So they took us down to the railroad and they put us on a flat car and I was run out of, ro run out of town on a rail. <laughs> they literally put our motorcycles and us on the flat car and said to the train, don't let them off. So we get to where the away. train end up. But even that was an interesting, as I say, we went to the disco, we went to the police chief's home for dinner, et cetera. <laughs> um, uh, so having been to all those places, favorite place to vacation. Oh, uh, I don't, I don't particularly like tourist places. Uh, my wife loves Bali, for instance, uh, which is a great tourist uh, attraction. Uh, I don't particularly like those places because I like to go to 
you know, I like to go to the bad places and the bad yeah. parts of town. What, and I've got as the favorite cuisine in all these trips, like what kind of regional food did you find the best? Well, I love Italian food. I love Italian wine, but I also like unagi, which is a great Japanese dish. It's eel, uh, yeah. eel and rice. I love unagi. Uh, I have learned recently about Korean an uh, anchovies. I can't believe how good they are. Fried silkworms. In Korea, I love fried silkworms. It's harder and harder to get them. Uh, though there's some delicate uh, iguana in South America, but it's harder and harder to get iguana. Though there's some great dishes. Never had monkey. Oh, I never tried monkey. People have tried, but for some things, I just monkey's too close to home for me. <laughs> yeah, so. never had monkey either. Um, and you got a favorite bow tie? You're not wearing the bow tie today. Well, if I had known, I would have dressed properly. Um, I don't, at the, at the moment, probably my, I have a polka dot bow tie, which I like. I have, a, if, if this were, I have a, Jap a Japanese, I, a Mount Fuji. I've written some bestsellers in Japan recently. So I wear Mount Fuji when I'm talking to the Japanese, because in Japan, there's a saying that everybody should climb Mount Fuji at least once but only a fool would climb it twice. So I love, and you cannot find, I had to have it specially made, my Mount Fuji bow ties. I, I guess those are my favorites. And how did that come about? That was just your look and you stuck with it or was it a, were you doing what, that from early on? No, no, bow ties were cheaper, Jeff. Ah. Much, much cheaper than, <laughs> than long less material, you right? Get them dirty, you don't get them dirty. Uh, if you get a bow tie dirty, it's much cheaper to clean it. I didn't have any money. God, smart. Still don't. Still don't. <laughs> I don't believe that. Um, what? Am, I got to ask about your goblet there. Is that gold too? It's silver. 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 Uh, I, I, my mother won some silver goblets when she was at university riding, and I still have them. Um, and silver, of course, kills germs. And it's a, I mean, silver is known as a way to stay more healthy. The Korean emperors used to only use silver chopsticks so nobody could poison them. Really? Silver has right. various and sundry advantages. Uh, and I use my mother's <laughs> old silver goblet still. I'm gonna have to get my McDonald's Diet Cokes in a silver goblet. Well, you would be healthier. It will yeah. kill germs. I'd be healthier if I didn't drink the soda whatsoever, but yeah, maybe well, in a silver different. cup would be better. I'm uh, drinking green tea, which I is, do drink a lot of green tea, actually. Green tea is also healthier, supposedly. Of coffee. Uh, and then lastly, your favorite Star Wars character. Hopefully you're a fan. Uh, I know I to a few. To you that I, I, I don't know enough about Star Wars. I did see it. 30, 40 years ago, um, but I, I haven't been back and I don't, I don't have a TV, Jeff. Uh, even if I did, I wouldn't, I wouldn't watch it. So uh, I don't go to many movies, I'm you afraid. Remember, I, you remember the lead guy or the lead bad guy? No, I'm nope. sorry. Luke Skywalker? I don't remember what I had for breakfast, Jeff. So <laughs> much less do I remember Luke Skywalker. I've heard uh, you cannot be alive without hearing Luke Skywalker. But if he walked in right now, I would not know who he was. All right. I wouldn't know it's a male. That's all I would know. <laughs> and so no TV. That helps you stay focused and get your ideas. You're not getting CNBC on the brain and getting confused with all that stuff. I'm saving my money, Jeff, when I... Get enough saved up, I'll buy a TV. <laughs> if you haven't heard, they, they're pretty cheap these days. Well, I know. I, actually, it really doesn't matter anymore. For instance, my children can watch anything they want on the Internet, and they do, you know, K-drama. Oh, my children know all about K-drama. They can watch TV from anywhere in the world that they want to, and they periodically do. <laughs> Crazy. Well, thanks, Jim. This has been fun. Um, we'll hope to look you up next time I'm in Singapore, which would be my first time, but, um, <clears throat> well, Jeff, you let me know when you're coming and I'll try to get enough money together to buy a TV. 
and yeah. we can watch TV together if you want. I want to go get some fried silkworms. Well, they are fabulous if you can find them. The only country where I have ever been able to find them is Korea, and it's street food. They, they you buy them in newspaper. They're wrapped in newspapers. Uh, you, they don't have them in fine restaurants, and they don't even have them that much as street food. I mean, Korea is getting more and more sophisticated, and you can buy tequila worms in Mexico if you, and those are very good. If you can buy fried tequila worms in Mexico, they're fabulous. All right, I'll, I'll take you up on that one. All right, Jim, thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. My pleasure, Jeff, and I urge you to watch the derivative. So you can figure out what's going to go on. You asked me some questions. I didn't have the answers. You know, I need to know when this is going to happen. And I need to know, need to know what to do about it. You say I should call RCM. So I'll call RCM. You call us Wait. up. We'll help you out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Let's you. do it again sometimes. We'll do. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye. listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCM Alt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.